Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back to Horus Heresy Lore Breakdown. A slightly more uh, experimental take this time. However, there are four short stories in this compilation, so I figured I would simply just divide them into four videos. Some of them are going to be longer, some of them are going to be shorter, and the primary reason why I'm going to do this is both as an experiment to see how it works with the compilation books, and also because the Reflection Cracked by Graham McNeil desires special attention. Because this book is probably, in my opinion, the flat-out worst book in the entire Horus Heresy series. And it's not necessarily because of the writing, or even because of the extraordinarily out of place and uncomfortable gay erotic torture scene that we get, apropos of fucking nothing, it is because of the damage it does to the Horus Heresy storyline. It takes a plot point that was established in Fulgrim that was a really interesting, open-ended and cool plot point that could have been turned into so many interesting ideas and stories down the line, and just completely, one-sidedly, with no explanation, build-up or preparation, just fucking kills it. <sighs> we'll go more uh, into detail about it as the short story uh, continues, but to sum it up quickly, Fulgrim was trapped within a painting, a painting that had some pretty damn serious religious and ritualistic connotations, having been created by Serena de Angelus as almost a sacrificial thing, uh, painted with various bodily fluids of people she murdered in states of ecstasy and anguish. It was very clearly far more than just a painting. She was, even it is hinted at, inspired by some um, unnatural entities in how to create it. So it wasn't just like a, a magical painting and suddenly it has magical powers, it was foreshadowed quite a bit that this was again, far more than just a painting. And so the demon that had existed within Fulgrim's sword, the Lear Silver Blade, first managed to fuck with Fulgrim's mind, convincing him that he was basically going insane, and then through breaking Fulgrim's mind, through making him conduct himself in ways that he himself never would have, from forcing him to do things that he absolutely hated, it then basically said, hey Fulgrim, look at the horrible things you've done, how can anyone possibly forgive you for this? But don't worry, just give it up. Let me take over control. I will kill you. I will let you rest. I will absolve you of all the responsibility, all of the guilt that you are feeling. And in a moment of weakness, after heavens only knows how many months of abuse by this demonic spirit, Fulgrim gives in and just lets go. That was a really cool end to Fulgrim, and only half an end as well. It made sense. It was Fulgrim as a tortured spirit, letting go to save his sanity and his sense of honor. It was Fulgrim doing, well, what Logar would have done if Logar wasn't evil. Again, it's one of the reasons why I maintain that Logar is the only true villain in the Horus Heresy. Because when Logar was... Logar wasn't made to do horrible things, he chose to do all of those horrible things. Whereas Fulgrim was forced and manipulated into doing so, and when brought face to face with the horrors that he had created, he was aghast by it, to the point where he basically committed suicide. But the demon, being cuntish as all demons are of course, decided to not free Fulgrim, to not kill him, and instead trapped him within a painting that was then mounted on the wall of La Fenice. The place where the demonic orgy that had finally completely broken the spirit of the Emperor's children had happened, cursing Fulgrim to look out upon his hubris and upon the doom and degeneration of his legion for all eternity. 
delicious absolutely delicious that is 40k that is the 41st millennium that is dark it is horror it is excess oh it is perfect and and best of all it leaves a certain glimmer of hope nothing is ever eternal if fulgrim spirit truly was trapped within this painting that means that his spirit still remains it could be freed, it could be liberated, the painting could be destroyed. Or maybe even Fulgrim would let himself out or be let out. The demon eventually considered, oh, he's been driven mad. Let's use him as a puppet to fulfill the final piece of the corruption. Or maybe even Fulgrim, after God only knows how many centuries mulling over the knowledge he had gained, would be able to break free. And suddenly there would be a Fulgrim, the Primarch Fulgrim in the 41st millennium. Oh, that would be so interesting. Just imagine the array of questions he would be raising, just both to himself and the Imperium. How would he engage with a modern day Imperium? How, what would his morals be? Would he have been driven crazy? Surely his perception would have been twisted, but additionally, equally surely, he must absolutely despise chaos. He would by no means necessarily be a loyalist, although, honestly, I think that would probably be the most interesting and heart-wrenching of stories that could be told from this. Imagine a Fulgrim freeing himself after 10,000 years into the 41st millennium, fully cognizant of the heinous crimes carried out both by himself, although under the control of the demon, or the very least influenced by it, and by his legion. How would he begin to interface with the Imperium? How would he come to recognize it, to understand it, seeing as he would have very little knowledge of what had happened outside of La Fenice? Would he become a, a vagabond, traveling the Imperium, doing good whatever he could? Would he raise an army of faithful to try and take control back? Would he try to re-establish the ideals of the Imperial truth that he had once betrayed? And not to mention, how would he ever get anybody to trust him again? Ah. Oh. And hell, there's also a completely different way. If he cannot integrate within the Imperium, but still hates chaos, perhaps he could become the Demon Prince of Malice, of Malal, the anti-chaos entity. So... I, I could go on. I could make an entire video, and probably will at some point, by the way, just exploring the possibilities of that story. And yet... For reasons unbeknownst to anyone beyond Graham McNeil himself, I would suppose, all of this was just killed. And and what took its place? Well, I, I guess we should move on with the short story, shouldn't we? So that you can share in my disappointment. We start with Lucius, who has rejoined the Emperor's children. You know, I always kind of liked Lucius' story. He was always a vain son of a bitch, and his eventual betrayal of Sal Tarvitz during the whole Little Istvan thing, it was neat, but at the same time was also good how he fought against the, um, the loyal traitors, I guess, the, or just the traitors, I suppose, is probably the, the correct term. Because he figured, you know, that's, that's a challenge, you know? Honestly, I would have thought he might have continued a bit longer, but I quite like his story, although his character is piss puddle shallow. But characters don't necessarily need to have all that much in the way of depth to be interesting. Anywho, he is dreaming. He is dreaming that he is in La Phoenicia, walking through its shattered halls scattered with offal. This is odd in and of itself, because Lucius claims that he doesn't dream, and yet this is still obviously a dream. He also mentions that whilst before, uh, you know, denying the Primarch or ignoring his decree would be foolhardy, you'd receive harsh punishment for that, but now it was a death sentence, which... Well, uh, yeah, everything considered, it probably would be, seeing as the uh, new ruler of the Emperor's children would be considerably less forgiving than the old one. Although, well, we'll get into that bit too in a while. 
For now, Lucius, in his dream, is drawn towards the painting. And this is where our first little strange thing happens. So the painting is described as being um, yeah, basic, nothing more than any normal artisan could create. Now, bearing in mind that Lucius at this point in time has been gene-enhanced, quote-unquote, by Fabius Bile's new art. And he's also been quite thoroughly steeped in the corruption of the Legion and Slanesh. So anything he views as prosaic or basic could be a work of marvellous art for what we would view it. He also knows this, in fact, that uh, before the painting was um, fantastic, incredible, with vivid colours and so on. That was the painting of Fulgrim as a monstrous creature. The painting created from the life, blood, and other bodily fluids of people that Serena de Angelis had slaughtered in her workshop. So, hmm. Now, this to me seems like a hint that, okay, well, here's the thing. If the demonic painting is the demon, demon inhabited it, all right, that explains the demonic nature of it and how it could act like a ritual to trap Fulgrim's soul. Right, makes sense. But if it is now returned to normal, then that is clearly suggesting that Fulgrim's spirit is still inside of it. Except, of course, it isn't, which we'll learn later on. Though, bearing in mind this is also a dream, so it might simply be that Lucius doesn't know the exact appearance of the portrait, and so doesn't know if it's actually changed back to the demonic visage, since it was hinted at that it was only the Fulgrim's spirit within the portrait that caused it to look like the way it should have looked, quote-unquote. Still, it is very clearly one of those author traps, basically, like, aha, you think this is the good story, but in reality, it was the shit one, but um, tish. I, I wish he would have saved himself that particular fucking twist, but, oh well. The silver blade of the Lear uh, is, uh, English, is also now in the possession of Lucius, which is rather interesting. I would almost think that from the demon, this would be a sign of mockery almost like here i this is my old vessel you can have this now whereas from fulgrim it would be well the corrupted fulgrim that is it would be more a sign of trust i guess and seniority and it was viewed like this within the legion as well and saw lucia's rise in prominence even being offered a leadership position which he basically then refused for no other reason than to piss off his fellow high officers a very, uh, Lucius thing to do. We also get some of his, uh, musings about the nature of the Legion, which is quite interesting. Uh, he mentions that a lot of the Legion has given up its pursuit of perfection, because they view that as an aspect of their old allegiance to the God Emperor. And now that they have so thoroughly turned away from them, why should they bother? Why should they bother being perfect in his eyes now? Why is there any point in the pursuit of perfection? Whereas Lucius is taking a little bit more of a long view. He continues his path of perfection as a gift to some higher powers. He's not entirely sure what's going on yet, but he presumes that the demons that appeared in La Fenice during the uh, Maravillia, Maravanglia, Maravilla, the loud music part, were some kind of astral manifestation of deities more <sighs> generous than the Emperor. That's one fuck of a, one fuck of a leap. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know, Lucius never struck me as really the clever sort in this, this regard. This seems again to me more like the author going like, Oh, look, he's figured something out. And I'm just like... Eh. I mean, Lucius strikes me like the guy who would absolutely make that kind of devotion if he was basically told, yeah, like, there's, there's gods out there, and, you know, they got demons and shit, and they can bless you if you worship them. But I don't really think he's clever enough to see a demon monster appear from thin air and go like, ah, oh, I see. This indicates the existence of a vastly powerful pantheon of elder gods that could potentially grant upon me unquantifiable favor and power. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, not really. But still, if nothing else, the note about the Legion giving up its um, pursuit of perfection is interesting, certainly, and it makes a great deal of sense as well. 
The other thing, too, that does make sense, like, Lucius is not the sharpest uh, tool in the toolbox, let's be honest here, and the whole, like, oh yes, I think there's gods out there, yeah, probably not, but he does mention how he's noticing something off about Fulgrim, and this, I think, is actually far more reasonable, because Lucius is a nearly unreliable swordsmaster. He would probably be able to pick up on these little subtle errors in Fulgrim's behavioural pattern. And also, we have to ask ourselves, how well could a demon ever truly replicate Fulgrim? I mean, he already... I, I kind of find it hilarious too. Lucius is like, yes, it's, it's very subtle, but I can see a difference in Fulgrim here. As Fulgrim walks down the hall, filled with screaming supplicants chanting his name, covered in ridiculously heavy makeup, <laughs> his armor a baroque catastrophe. <laughs> <laughs> and there's Lucius like, hmm, something is slightly off. <laughs> oh, Jesus. I mean, I, I know what he's, he's, he's getting at the fact that, you know, it's, it's not the, it, it, it's, um, how do I put this? So Fulgrim has changed massively to a fucking comical extent. But what Lucius is really addressing here is that the comically changed Fulgrim is now slightly out of tune with the comically changed Fulgrim. <laughs> it's, it makes sense on the one hand and it sounds like utter fucking lunacy on the other. <laughs> ay ay ay. So, uh, I, I, I cannot shake... I almost need to commission art of this, I swear to god, with just this complete, over-the-top, ridiculous, drag queen version of Fulgrim's strolling down a hallway glittering with gold as Lucius just sits off in a corner being like, eh, indeed, something is slightly off, but anywho. His point is that he's, he's on the way to starting to suspect that Fulgrim could have been possessed by something. He also notes why the Emperor's children kept their name. Now, I always assumed that it was because, you know, it was, it was a cuntish thing to do. We're the Emperor's children, yet yeah, we're clearly the most debauched of traitors, thereby stating that, you know, this was what the Emperor really wanted for us. This was the Emperor's fault, etc. Fulgrim, uh, Fulgrim, Lucius elaborates a bit on this, and it's basically that. The Emperor's children were wrecking the pride of the Emperor, their flagship, uh, melting down the Aquilas, burning the banners, etc. Uh, Lucius even suggests that they were close to destroying the whole ship, which sounds extreme, but, you know, extreme is pretty much the Emperor's children's middle name at this point, so perhaps and Fulgrim had stopped them from doing so. He had also resisted calls to change the name of the Legion, and he said that they would keep it to remind their enemies that they fight against brothers, and to remind them of how far they had fallen. Which, again, makes a great deal of sense, because it's the kind of asshole move I would very much so expect of the Emperor's children at this point in time. And oh my, they, they've fallen fast and hard, haven't they? See, this is one of my little complaints about the Hordus Heresy as a whole. I feel like the build-up to the betrayal was... perfect. Like, the three first books in the series... Art. Absolute fucking art. It keeps you... you know what's gonna happen, and yet the books keep teasing you tantalizingly that maybe there is a way out. It all feels balanced on the edge of a knife. And then Eastfawn happens, and the Traitor Legions go full fucking cray-cray, just like that. Now, the Emperor's children, uh, their first captains are deformed, they've cut off their ears, they've ripped open their cheeks, um, <laughs> all kinds of insanity, like triangular holes where the ears used to be. Um, one's bound his mouth open with barbed wire. Uh, Lucius has installed barbs in his armor so that if he ever swings his swords with anything less than absolute art, they'll cut into him and tear him open. It's like... <laughs> Shit. This is like... What? Weeks? Weeks after Istvan at most? Christ, that is... I mean, I, I would I would have liked to see a little bit of a, a slow fall, like um, Adolin being enhanced with the sonic weaponry from Fabius Bile, for example. Okay, cool, that's a little bit subtle. It's, well, subtle. It, it literally allows him to shout super loud. Uh, subtle might not be the correct term, but at least it's not an outward 
disfiguration, you know? It's something you could keep hidden if you wanted to. And I know there's no need to keep anything hidden anymore, but they go from loyalists to full chaos marines in days. <sighs> Again, I would have liked for there to be more of a step-by-step um, -step process. Like, first they figured out that, okay, hey, if I um, rearrange my armor to be more pleasing, then I gain favor within the Legion. Or, hey, if I, um, I do this, then I gain favor. Or, hey, maybe even, like, oh, hey, I did these things, and then I got, like, um, a second set of eyes that made me see better. Something. Something to incentivize the fall rather than simply have it be immediate. Now, in the case of the Emperor's Children, however, there is a little bit of an extenuating factor as well, and that is that the Legion has been falling for a while. But again, the Legion has been falling for quite some time, with the crescendo being the Mareva love 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 in the La Phoenicia. But again, you had them be loyalists one second, and <laughs> stringing harps with human entrails in the next one, you know? Hey. Anyhow, a little bit more uh, level-headed would be nice. I do love how Lucius needles all of his fellow commanders, though. Lucius gives zero shits. He, he knows he's better than all of them at fighting, and that is the only metric that he cares about. He doesn't give a shit about anything else, and he is keenly interested in humiliating those around him. Like, he's just the vilest little shit ever. And I can kind of appreciate that in a character. It, um, it certainly gives him a sense of purpose, doesn't it? And uh, speaking of the drastic changes, so... Lucius already mentioned that before disobeying the Prime Hark was foolhardy, now it was suicide. And we get an example of that as Fulgrim appears in his new throne room, essentially, and announces the plans for the coming campaign, where they are attacking a Mechanicus world. It is, um... <sighs> how, how do I put this? Fulgrim appears to be deviating from the missions given to him by Horus. <laughs> him and every other goddamn traitor Primarch, it seems. Adolin suggests, and this is the very dumb thing for him to do, that maybe Fulgrim has, um, has made a mistake here or something? He's misunderstood something, perhaps? Because apparently, the orders given to them by Horus had been to advance upon Mars. Now, whether or not Adolin would know this, I'm somewhat unsure of, but it sounds as if, the, the conversation makes it sound as if Horus was planning a Blitzkrieg-style assault upon Terra, which would be reasonable, but on the other hand, as we'll see in later books, that doesn't actually seem to be what Horus was planning either, so it's a bit of an odd one, uh, but... You know, Adolin suggests this in a very nice manner, and uh, Fulgrim takes offence. A lot of offence. He goes so crazy and accusing Adolin of all manners of insane shit, considering Adolin was just like, um, are you sure about this? Uh, to the point where, when Adolin, what was it, Fulgrim first suggests, like, ah, oh, is this the treason you have for me? Like, oh, how can you, how can you repay me with questions when I give you a war? Are you too good for my campaign? And Adolin says something like, I would never dream of betraying you. At which point, Fulgrim turns on him and goes, like, oh, you speak of betrayal? <laughs> and then he chops Aitlin's head off. That's just... Right, that was... Uh, that, that was quite the exchange. I... Again, do you see my point? Like, the Legion went from a military force to this in, in fucking weeks. Though this might also be Fulgrim just making a point because he pushes it to such an autistic extreme that I'm kind of tempted to say that he is doing this purposefully. Like, he wanted to have an excuse to kill, if not Aedlin, then one of his officers to demonstrate to the rest that uh, questions will not be tolerated by the new regime.
He also, there may be another part as well, which I'm a little bit more iffy on. So Lucius now states that when he observes Fulgrim chop Aedlin's head off, Lucian is like, oh, you, you're slower than I thought, thinking it rather than saying it because he's smarter than Aedlin. And Lucius then goes, I could beat you if I fought you right now. And this later on will be revealed to be a trap set by Fulgrim, Fulgrim teasing him, seeing if he can get Lucius to attack him, which... On the one hand, I would... Sure, I, the Primarch would probably have the skills to lay that trap, but why? Why is he baiting Lucius? Is it because it gives him a sense of danger? But the thing is, Fulgrim isn't going to lose to Lucius. That's ridiculous. Like, he even pretty much states that himself, you know, at the end of the story, like, Bitch, you have no fucking chance. And even Lucius accepts that as well, so... I don't know. Then again, what reason does a demon Primarch, or what will eventually become a demon Primarch, need to tease someone with potentially lethal consequences? Anywho... Fulgrim's real goal here is the acquisition of a crystallic material. It is the reason why he has, well, no point in sugarcoating it, I suppose, flat out just ignored Horus's orders. Good start there. Horus is like, I will do better than my father. I will reorganize the Imperium. Five seconds thereafter, every single godforsaken one of his lieutenants tells him to get fucked and waffles off on their own adventures. <sighs> Turns out that cajoling the Primarchs was uh, actually a pretty damn difficult task. <laughs> oh well. Fulgrim has little problems in overcoming the local Adeptus Mechanicus defenses who are probably, well, quite surprised that they are suddenly under attack by the Emperor's children of all things, and were they more mortal than machine, they might also be wondering why they look so goddamn strange all of a sudden. And speaking of strange, we get an entire scene with Fulgrim talking to himself as basically a half-attempted trap, I feel like, where the book is trying to be like, oh, it's Fulgrim. He's pleading with his demonic master to let him come out and play, but it, it was at this point I immediately was like, hold on, it's the demon, isn't it? Because it speaks of offering him favor, you know, we can we can delve the depths of the Immaterium together, we can gain ever more power, and so on and so on. It's immediately pretty goddamn obvious that the demon is the one that is now trapped in the painting, although Fulgrim offers no real explanation as to how this had happened. He simply goes on about how he has learned some immaterial skills, and he also demonstrates this during the fight, whilst the demon of course responds by stating that these are mere parlor tricks. We should of course take anything a demon says with a metric ass ton of salt, but I how the hell did Fulgrim learn this? The demon didn't really give him much in the way of secrets when he was inhabiting its flesh, now did it? Because, well, it literally tried to hide itself as a mental illness for most of the time. Uh, okay, so Fulgrim is back in control of his body and well, he, he's clearly gotten quite twisted. The demon brings forth a representation of Ferus Manus, and Fulgrim just kind of laughs at it. Do you think you could shame me? When in reality, I mean, yes, it could. Shame was the way the demon got Fulgrim to give over his body in the first place. And again, now, completely off camera, Fulgrim is just laughing at the very idea, like, ha ha ha, you think you can shame me? I am far beyond that, really. You weren't, like, a week ago, but okay, fine, never mind, I suppose. It's, just, it's so strange, like, the, the entire story feels like there should be a whole novel in between this and that, but, anyhow... Lucius is then the next character we see because Fulgrim basically just whinges at his reflection for a while. It's, it feels like, I don't know, it feels like setup, it feels like exposition, but it feels like the kind of setup that would, you know, come at the mid point in a story rather than at the beginning of one. 
But Lucius. Lucius is playing with his reflection because Lucius. And then Julius Caserne shows up and starts taunting him because he doesn't like Lucius and well the Emperor's children are basically cunts at this point so taunting each other is what they do. And he says something rather interesting. He kind of mocks and derides Fulgrim. Perhaps that's too strong a term. He basically states that whilst the Primarchs are luminous beings, they, referring to the Emperor's children, serve a much greater power than the Primarchs. Again, that is interesting. Now, him being part of the higher leadership of the Legion, he undoubtedly would have access to far more in the way of in-depth lore and legend than Lucius, so him knowing about the Chaos Gods makes more sense than Lucius figuring this shit out just by his lonesome. But even then, again, th the corruption of the Legion, it is so goddamn quick. Like, they go from basically worshipping Fulgrim to being like, oh, Fulgrim, yeah, I mean, he's pretty and all, and he glows ever so prettily in the dark, but he's not the real boss man. <laughs> I again feel like we are missing just an entire book here easily, if, if not more, to actually explain how all of them arrived at this conclusion. I mean, we've seen parts of the uh, the infection, of course, via the, the Lodge, in this case called the Brotherhood of the Phoenix, but again, it, it feels like we were traveling, you know, 10 kilometers per hour, and now we're breaching the speed of light. And perhaps even more interesting is that Lucius wonders why Caserin has even sought him out, and... From something he says, and talks about the Primarch and how luminous he is, but still not that important, Lucius begins to suspect that maybe Caserin has seen what he has seen, and is starting to doubt whether or not Fulgrim is, well, really Fulgrim. Turns out that uh, Lucius is not the only one being teased by their Primarch, it seems. But Lucius needs proof. Or rather than proof, he needs certainty. He needs to be sure that he's not just going batshit insane, or that the voices are speaking to him again. And so he goes to La Fenice, where he encounters a group of Phoenix guards, who are still, uh, at the very least, mildly recognisable as the elite formation they once were, and they tell him that entry into the... La Fenice, entry into La Fenice is death. La Fenice. The word fucks me up, it really does. Lucius then decides to just simply fucking murder them all, which, um... All right, well, uh, I, I hope he was right about that whole uh, Fulgrim stuck in the painting thing, otherwise... <laughs> he's, he's really taken it pretty far this time, hasn't he? He even gets wounded, which is... See, th this is kind of the issue when you have um, a character like Lucius, like, oh yes, he's the best person ever, and then he gets wounded, and then you're just expected to be like, well, I guess you... I guess he did a whoopsie. You have to introduce the sense of well, suspense, I suppose. You know, oh, he could actually die. Well, no, he, he couldn't, but oh well. Details. And there it is. The portrait hanging in La Fenice is Fulgrim in all of his finery, in all of his nobility, in all of his drab, unimaginative colours at least in the views of the somewhat um, extreme interpretation of uh, the Emperor's children. This, then, is all the evidence that Lucius needs, that something is terribly, terribly wrong. And when he sees the eyes of the painting, which he describes as filled with an unimaginable depth of sorrow, he concludes that this must be Fulgrim trapped within the painting. Again, Seems like a bit of a leap of logic, but then he, at least now he's had um, visions in his dreams and suggestions and these these little suspicions 
Again, it, it seems like one fuck of a leap, but hell, it's it's something. He then calls upon the Brotherhood of the Phoenix, which he hasn't really been engaged with much at all, really. He's always, always spurned their supposed Brotherhood. And yet, even so, a full 20 of them appear when he asks them to come. Amongst them, Fabius Bile and Julius Caserin. This immediately confirms to Lucius that, uh, indeed, there are others who have suspected the same thing that he has, though he now has to convince them of this ridiculous thing. Oh, hey! Um, so the Primarch isn't the Primarch. The Primarch is stuck in a painting in La Fenice. Now, I can't show you the painting, but, you know, believe me. <laughs> uh, and, and eventually they do. They do threaten him a bit, but um, Julius and Fabius both agree with Lucius. Fabius even going so far as to say that the Primarch's biology is changing, is rewriting itself as if it is preparing itself to uh, be reformed. He uses the metaphor of um, a butterfly entering into a pupae and then appearing as a, a lovely colorful creature and talks about how wondrous this must be. Basically, he's suggesting that Fulgrim has not only been transformed and taken over, but that he is not yet completed his transformation. This freaks out some of the Emperor's children because, well, they now realize that they're under command by something that they have no fucking clue what is, or what its intentions may be for the demon, for, for the demon, for the Legion. And in a wonderful moment of true compassion and uh, loyalty, they decide to rescue Fulgrim. They don't quite know how yet, but they presume that they need to capture Fulgrim and drive out the demon. <laughs> Which again, is just like, how do you reach these conclusions? Like, oh, well, he must be possessed by a demon, right? Okay, fair enough. Oh, we should we need to drive it out, right? <laughs> Go on, go on. I guess they're basically leaning on ancient folk tales at this point. Uh, we also do get an interesting little insight into how uh, Lucius supposedly gained his idea that there are, you know, gods out there. So he mentions that he saw one of the people during the Maravenglia, Muravenglia, Miga Maga Miga Mug, whatever the hell, in La Fenice be presumably possessed, and how the person's flesh ran like wax, wax, as, um, as he, as she, wasn't it? Um, it was, um, oh god, I can't remember her name, the, the opera woman thingy. Uh, that she was possessed and her flesh ran like wax to be reformed into a form more pleasing to the creature that had possessed her. Again, seems like one fuck of a leap of logic. Again, I, I must remind you here, these guys have fought their entire lives for the imperial truth. They have literally spent their entire lives fighting for a perfect state of scientific reason where gods and deities and angels etc are all considered insane nonsense and yet all of them just accept this immediately I, it, it does really annoy me i guess it's just to speed up the, st the story which you know fair enough but again this really did need a little bit more of a build-up we do get one interesting mention, so the, the Hall of Swords, where Fabius Bile has his little laboratory and such on, it is being used by the various flesh crafters of the Legion to show off their new art. Now, that I quite liked, you know, they were using the statues of all the heroes, um, draping them with various uh, horrible monstrosities that they had carved out from the flesh of captives and su such on. I like that! See, that is the kind of fluff that we need, because that... Like, 
we should have like a short story of the first person who was like, right, I kind of like Fabius. He's he's my bro. I, I admire him greatly for, you know, all of the crazy shit that he's done. How do I attract his attention? Well, I've heard that he has a secret base in the saw in the Hall of Swords. What if I create like a rat human hybrid with 12 buttholes and only five hands with which to wipe them and hang them from a statue? That's, that's got to get his attention, right? <laughs> that would be an aspect of the Legion's fall that would be, it'd be nice. It'd be, I would appreciate a little bit more world building like that. Anywho, they now come up with the ridiculous idea of uh, capturing Fulgrim and presumably beating the demon out of him. <sighs> Good luck, I suppose. And, well, I mean, they are lucky in a way, in that uh, Fulgrim is surprisingly cooperative. A fact that the conspirators do suspect, but never quite latch on to. Uh, presumably because they are Empress children, and they just assume that they're actually good enough to take on a Primarch and win. They carry out quite the neat little ambush of him, with 50 of their numbers against him alone. Uh, one of their number is killed and another is permanently crippled, and a couple more are sent into a healing coma. Four in trade for a Primarch. Lucius does mention that he thinks that this was an awfully cheap price to pay for subduing a Primarch, but... Uh, None of them quite um, latch on to the trick, I suppose. But again, as I mentioned, they're Emperor's children. Of course, they would simply just assume that they were good enough to carry this out, regardless of how absurd it might actually seem. Now that Fulgrim has been subdued, Fabius drags him down into his laboratory, where he promises to drive out the demon. And Fulgrim decides to muddy the waters further by saying, like, oh yeah, no, I'm totally a demon. Um, I, I am a demon created by a luminous being, the Emperor Wrestler, as an amalgamation of flesh and war power and such on. It's an interesting thought because there is definitely something of the unnatural about the Primarchs that's been suggested quite heavily and clearly, and Fulgrim now seemingly confirming that is interesting, but again, it is a Fulgrim that is gone fully and completely insane. The arts of the Primarchs are probably more akin to that of psychers, I'd probably say. Uh, a specific mutation, a designed mutation, rather than the stuff of the Immaterium itself. Because otherwise, how would they be so stable, you know? That's one of the things that's always confused me about the idea of the Primarchs having a large part of their being uh, made up of the Immaterial energies that supposedly created them, because at the end of the day, for all their flaws, they are remarkably stable beings. Oh, except for the two whom we shall not speak about, I suppose. And now we get to the strange part, the extraordinarily out of place and extended torture session with some downright fucking uncomfortable under and overtones. Lucius and his new friends set about torturing Fulgrim for 40 minutes in the audiobook. <laughs> that is uh, about as long as you've listened to this video, and it's all very detailed descriptions of torture, whilst Fulgrim, being tortured, is sighing and moaning in pleasure. Mildly uncomfortable, but oh well. See, this scene would be odd in any other book, and certainly a little bit out of place, but considering the revelation that is about to happen at the end of this chapter as well, where Fulgrim is like, Retard, it's me, it's been me all along, idiots! It just comes as, I don't know, I feel like most people who read this book read the torture and pleasure part, including a pair of anguish inserted into Fulgrim's anus and 
No, you don't need to Google what a pair of anguish is, trust me. You are better off without this knowledge. And so let us merrily skip over the whole torture part, it's not very effective in the slightest really, and let's instead talk a little bit about Fulgrim's philosophy that he presents here and also the result of all this nonsense. So, Fulgrim, whilst moaning and groaning in pleasure from being penetrated in many new and interesting ways, certainly, gives his audience a view into his mind. His philosophy. He states that humanity and indeed all life, the universe itself, always trends towards complexity, an increase in complexity and depth of the material universe. And he views humanity as but one step on this path towards what he refers to as perfect complexity. His argument basically is that Everything always seeks to become something more than it once was, which I'm not a biologist by any stretch of the imagination, but I don't think that's actually true. I mean, look at our own planet. We humans are pretty much the only species which could be described in this way, always seeking towards more complexity, becoming more than we once were. And that's technologically as well, like the human form has evolved very little. And if you look at the vast majority of wildlife too, evolution is an incredibly slow and frankly often completely and utterly stagnant process. You can see animals that have remained mostly unchanged for centuries if not millennia. I guess you could argue that Fulgrim is taking the extreme long view and is talking about millions upon millions of years, but even then in the 41st millennium that's not really true either, now is it? Because the old ones were far more complex technologically and presumably also biologically speaking, considering their skills at biological manipulation, than humanity, so surely the galaxy has actually devolved in that sense. Then again, Fulgrim would not know about that. It's, I'm not at all convinced about Fulgrim's idea here, and at the end of the day, it is nothing more than a justification. It is a... it's basically the greater good argument. Because everything, in Fulgrim's opinion, is seeking towards greater complexity, anything and everything that seeks to encourage or enhance that search towards complexity must therefore be defined as good, and anything that attempts to stop this increase in complexity or enforce stagnation must therefore be evil. Basically, it, it is literally the greater good argument. I have stated that this is how I perceive the world. My perception of the world is 100% good because I have stated that it is good, and therefore, since it is pure good, anything that is in opposition to it is pure evil. It's a very, uh... <laughs> It's a very Logar view on morality, isn't it? Oh, I have this belief, and therefore I must follow this belief to the absolute extremis, regardless of any and all actions required of me in the pursuit of this one idea. Because the idea in and of itself is the greater good, in whose name anything cannot only be justified, but it is in fact eminently desirable. And as luck would have it, now that I have defined this thing as good, I find myself on the correct side of history. <laughs> How fortunate that my own arbitrary moral decisions about the universe apparently seeking complexity favours my stance on the matter. Very, very fortunate indeed. And so, for the first time ever, I find myself in complete and utter agreement with Lucius, in that whilst Fulgrim may have been pretty, he was no philosopher. But now, 
at the very end, how did Fulgrim do it? How did he manage to trick the demon into not only letting him have his body back, but also tricking the demon into the painting, the prison that it had created for Fulgrim? Well, um, he just did it, <laughs> apparently. App it when the demon ousted Fulgrim from his body and trapped it within the painting, apparently Fulgrim wasn't trapped within the painting at all. He simply just chilled out for a little bit, um, snooped on the demon, learned everything it knew, and then reversed engineered the entire process. <laughs> Of course! Of course, obviously, yes. Of course. <sighs> this has got to be really embarrassing for the fucking demon, isn't it? <laughs> uh, he, he stole Fulgrim's body, and then whilst Fulgrim was trapped in a painting, then over the course of a few weeks, the Fulgrim figured out more about possession than the demon knew and took over his body again and trapped the demon in the painting. Damn. That is some of the worst writing I think I have ever actually seen. And not even just in, like, the execution of it. It, it is the complete and utter annihilation of the story that was and the replacing of that story with some ramshackable monstrosity that bears little to no resemblance to, well, anything that came before it. <laughs> it is... It, it's, it's literally taking a pickaxe to a work of art and erecting a pile of penis-shaped poop in its stead and going, there we go, that's what I intended all along. My, I can only assume that Graham McNeil was forced to do this by some executive at Black Library who was like, no, 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 we can't have Fulgrim be trapped in the painting. That would be wrong for some unknowable reason. So, you know, let him out, let him out. And Graham is just like, how? And the executive is like, how? I, I pay you to figure out how. And be quick about it, would you? I have an entire franchise to ruin. I can't spend too much time fucking up merely one piece of 40k. And after that absolute desecration, the book ends with a little hint that in the next one, or is it the next one? In a little while anyways, Fulgrim will be playing around with Petravo. Now, that book I actually quite like because the contrast of Petarabo and Fulgrim is really cool and funny. It also is one of the first books where we really get a decent look at Petarabo as well, that grouchy old little bastard. But this book, I, I hate, I absolutely despise The Reflection Cracked. Not because of its writing, its writing is... All right. It doesn't quite have the soul that you know you usually see in Graham McNeil's books, but it, it's adequate. It's the fucking massacring of a really interesting and intriguing plot point. That's the problem, and it's just hand waved away. Oh, Fulgrim learned all of the demon's tricks whilst chilling in the painting because. That's how things work these days, apparently. And now he doesn't feel any remorse whatsoever. He doesn't care about killing um, uh, Ferris Manas at all. All of that just whoosh, whisked out the window. All of that character development, all of that progression, all of that depth of emotion, all of it gone. And Fulgrim is now just a villain who moans when he gets tortured. How to destroy a character <laughs> in one short story is what this uh, little thing should actually be called. Anywho, let us move on to the next one in the next video.